strawberry wine or peach wine. <laughs> you can have flavor. <laughs> what else? What else do we know about the Holy Eucharist? Come on, dear Catholic people who went to confirmation. What else can you tell me about? Anything else? No? Okay, that's fine. Okay, so do we know something? Yes, sir. Uh, it's a mortal sin to consume the Eucharist while in a state of mortal sin. Okay, it's a sin. Yeah, do not receive the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin. Right? So I'll do this. Okay. Do not receive the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin. Yes, Dan Fogg? It's, uh, it's inextricably tied to the celebration of the, of the Holy Mass. Okay, tied to the celebration of the Mass. So, in other words, you cannot celebrate the Eucharist outside of Mass, right? Correct. Okay. It has to be during the Mass. Okay. Anything else? Is that it? Okay, does anyone know about its tie to the Old Testament and the animal sacrifices? Who knows something about, do you know something about the animal sacrifices? A little bit. Okay, tell me what you know. Um, so for Passover, um, when the Israelites were let out of Egypt, God asked for them to sacrifice a year old unblemished male lamb. Okay. And that the Passover was supposed to be celebrated forever. Okay. Um, and so that Passover evolved over time when the temple happened, um, sacrifices were in the temple, but it was an animal sacrifice where a lamb, an unblemished lamb, was sacrificed. So, okay. if you want to continue. Okay, we're not going to have an unblemished, blemished conflict all of a sudden here? No? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little joke. Right. Okay, so the Old Testament animal sacrifices, which by the way were not uh, limited to the uh, Israelite people. These things were carried on by different groups throughout Mesopotamia, but they were very special to the Jewish people. And we know that uh, an altar was built out of stone, and the one who offers the sacrifice, or would offer the sacrifice, would be a priest, because a priest, by definition, is one who offers a sacrifice. So these groups would offer, and in some places they were women, okay, not, not the, the Jewish people, but in other places, so the priest or the priestess would offer this sacrifice. So in the case of the Jewish people, they would offer the sacrifice. So the one, usually the father of the family, would offer the sacrifice of the lamb to the Lord and to use or to get or to gather the perfect lamb or the best lamb in the flock. Remember, this is how a person was judged their status by how many sheep they had, their livestock, okay, because they didn't have cash. So, uh, if you had a lot of livestock, then you were a rich man. So, they would offer the best lamb, okay, in the case of the sheep, the unblemished lamb, that was the one that they would normally be saving for the big feast, that one is the one they would offer up to the Lord. Now, they did this uh, because they were, number one, giving thanks to God, their attempt to thank God for favors, okay, remember that word, thank you. Uh, but also to win God's favor by atoning for sin. Trying to win God's favor by atoning for sin. That's three things. Perhaps there's more, but in acts of thanksgiving. Okay, so for example, after the Israelites went through the sea, they escaped the hand of the Egyptians. Okay, they offered the, the sacrifice in thanksgiving to God, but also to atone for sin and therefore win God's favor. All right? So they would offer these sacrifices. Of course, then came the Passover when they made it through the waters of the sea. And our Lord, prior to that, before that happened, as you know, and have you ever seen uh, Cecil B. DeMille's uh, The Ten Commandments? I know they made a remake, which is not worth watching. But if you're going to watch a good uh, Ten Commandments movie, you've got to go back to the 1950s. Yes, sir? The one with Charles Heston. Yes, Chuck Heston. That's Moses. Right? <laughs> Moses. And uh, Moses, by the way, was in the original uh, Planet of the Apes. Yeah, it's true. Chuck has, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so um, as you know, our Lord made the promise that he would rescue them and he would send the plague, okay? And that they were to, each family, procure the lamb, the unblemished lamb, slaughter it, and then the blood be smeared over the, the lentils on the door, the doorpost. And then when the plague would come, 
seeing those who were obedient to God's command to do just as he told Moses, the plague would pass over, and then the people would escape. Of course, those who were not obedient to God's command, this plague would come to claim the firstborn, okay, of man and beast alike, all right? So in the case of Pharaoh, it was his son who was taken, all right? So every year, the Jewish people would come together, and they would offer this sacrifice of the lamb together in remembrance of that event. It was called the Passover, all right? Okay, and again, in that case, it was an act of thanksgiving in remembrance of, but other times it was an attempt to appease God's favor by atoning for sin, the animal sacrifices. So let's just stick with that for a minute, the atonement of sin. Okay, the atonement uh, for sin. Does that look like an F? Close enough. Right? To win God's favor by atoning for sin. So they would just slaughter these animals, and blood would be poured out, and then what would happen? The, the, the flesh was boiled, the priest and the people would consume this flesh of this animal, all in an attempt to win God's favor by atoning for sin. There's only one problem with this. And do you know what it is? Why could these sacrifices not atone for sin and win God's favor? Why? Why wasn't our Lord just so pleased with this? Oh, this is great. Okay, you're good. Not Why? eternal. Because what? They're not eternal. What's not eternal? The lamb sacrifices. Okay, they're Fine. not eternal. All right. Hmm? Okay. They're not eternal. That's true. Okay, but there's something more I'm looking for. What did sin come through? Man. Man. Not an animal. Right? Sin came through a man. The man Adam and Eve, or, or Adam and Eve, okay? The two together, okay? So, in order to atone for sin and win God's favor, what would have to be sacrificed? In order to reverse the sin of Adam and Eve, what would have to be sacrificed? A perfect, unblemished man. That's exactly right, and I'm glad you said that. Not just a man, because where was God going to find a perfect man since... After Adam and Eve sinned, every generation would be conceived and born, okay, in the state of original sin. So God would have to find, there would have to be, we would have to find a perfect man, and where would that person come from? Okay, there was no perfect man to sacrifice. So, and I'm, without even looking at the scripture, we all know the story, you can find it in Genesis 22, the story of Abraham, Correct? where Abraham is told by God to sacrifice his son. Now, this is all something that points to the person of Jesus Christ. Remember, everything in the Old Testament is a setup. It points to, it's a prefigurement, a foreshadowing to the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law and all the prophets. Everything, every story, every event, everything points to the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so in this great story of prefigurement, here God speaks to Abraham and says, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. Uh, excuse me? Yes, I want you to sacrifice to me your son. So Abraham gets his son and wakes him up early in the morning and says, come on son, we have to go take care of some business. So Abraham sticks wood on his son's back and says, okay, you're going to carry the wood that we're going to need for the fire for the sacrifice. So the son is walking and at some point he says, dad, we have you know, we're going to build this altar. We have the wood, which his son is carrying on his back, right? But dad, where is the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham, probably not even knowing it, well, we know he didn't even know it at the time, said, son, God will provide the sacrifice. Because there was no land. God will provide the sacrifice. So then there's Abraham, and at some point, he looks over and he sees a ram, a lamb, a male lamb, with its head stuck in the thicket. Probably a thorny bush. Okay? So you see, you see how this points, this event points to the person of Jesus Christ? So you got a son, the son of Abraham, who's going to sacrifice his kid. The son carries the wood on his back, just as Jesus carried the wood of the cross on his back. And then when the son says, well, Dad, we don't have the sacrifice, uh, the, the animal, and, and then Abraham says, no, son, the Lord will provide. Okay, and then he spots the lamb, so now the lamb prefigures Christ with its head caught in the thicket, just as Jesus was crowned with thorns. 
Okay, so the point is, our Lord would eventually do away with these animal sacrifices, okay? And provide us a perfect man by becoming one himself, so that he himself, as both victim and priest, could offer himself, all right, to the Father, to once attend, or once for all, that is, atone for sin, and once for all, win God's faith. All right? All right. So, having said this, Jesus Christ is going to offer himself as a sacrifice. In the Old Testament times, when the animals were sacrificed, what happened? The blood was poured out. Okay, the flesh was boiled. The priest and the people consumed the flesh of the lamb. All right? Okay? And again, what were those three acts? Thanksgiving, to atone for sin, and to win God's favor by atoning for sin. Okay, so I'll get rid of this Genesis, because we've already gone through this. This is the uh, sacrifice of Abraham, that, uh, or, or Isaac by Abraham. And then, of course, what happened before Abraham to put a happy end to this, because this isn't the walking dead, you know. So uh, right before he was about to da dive in the dagger, the angel appeared and said, Stop, Abraham, don't lay a finger on that kid. Okay, don't do it. Don't do it. All right. So, um, now having said that, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, now if, you're, if you get into a debate with uh, Protestants, now many Protestants, what do, what do, what do, okay, at Calvary Chapel or Sagebrush, what are they going to tell you about Holy Communion? First, they never use the word Eucharist. Which, by the way, what does the word mean? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's what it means. Okay? What are we giving thanks to God for when we celebrate the Eucharist, the Passover, the Passover of death that comes to claim us? We who are now sealed with the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the sacrificed Lamb of God, it, the plague of death comes, we are sealed, passes right over. We may die physically, but we live forever. Okay, so Thanksgiving. So what do... Calvary Chapel, sagebrush people, and so on believe about Holy Communion. Once again, they never say Eucharist. What do they, what do they teach us about? What do they believe about? Um, it's, symbolic. it's symbolic, right? Just a symbolic thing. Okay, and it's uh, like a, uh, what, what, a memo, uh, just to remember, the, it's an act to remember the, the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, did I spell that right? No. Okay. When you get older, you so uh, it's a symbol, just a remembering, right? Okay, what do, what do some groups, and I believe the Episcopalians would fit in with this, what do others believe about the Holy Eucharist? And I think the Episcopalians. You know what they believe? They believe in this. Consubstantiation. Okay, consubstantiation. What does this mean? Yes? I don't know if this is correct, but I think it's like like Christ is next to or at the same time. It's, I don't know, it's really strange to explain. Okay, they believe, yes. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Good shared, by the way. Good band, I've seen them twice. A long time ago, long before probably you were born. But they're a great them? band, like, what? Did you meet them? Uh, no, I never met them. That's a band I didn't meet. Okay, but they believe, okay, so I think, again, Piscopan believe that... The bread and the wine remains bread and wine, but that the Lord becomes present in the bread and wine. So it's both at the same time. Consubstantial. Okay, so we as Catholics, what do we believe about the Holy Eucharist? We believe in transubstantiation. Okay, transubstantiation means that the bread and the wine are completely obliterated, and it really truly becomes, substantially becomes, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, have you ever heard anyone talk about accidents? Yes. yes. Yeah? Who can tell me what that means? Is that two cards colliding? No. It's no, what is it? The nature of a thing. Okay, the nature of a thing, right? Being changed, right? So what we believe as Catholics is that the accidents change. Uh, is that right? Is that right? The, the substance changes. The okay, accidents. Okay, so then, so what are you trying to tell me now? Wait, I thought it was the form of bread and wine, but the accidents of body blood. Okay, so two different principles. Okay, so the substance changes, right? Completely is transformed, right? Uh, let's see. Uh, what would what would be? Is there a symbol for? Uh, uh, Cairo. Huh? The Cairo. Is that what it is? 
Well, if you're, it's being changed into Christ. So yeah. Just, you can just do a Cairo. Like that? There you go. Hey, I didn't know. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so the substance changes. What remains are the accidents. So the taste of bread, the smell of bread, the, the you know, the texture, everything, that changes. Uh, or though that stays the same, but the substance changes. This is what we as Catholics believe. All right? Okay, and this goes, if you're, if you're, if you're explaining this to non-Catholic uh, Christians or anyone else, oh, I don't understand this Eucharist, what you guys believe? <laughs> well, listen, it's really, it's, it, it takes, first of all, they have to have faith to, to believe, but I simply said, I always just kind of point to this Old Testament and kind of set them up with this and say, look, you know, what I just told you about these Old Testament animal sacrifices and then tie it into what Abraham did as a setup to what our Lord was going to give us. Okay, and then simply you go to, where do you go? Where do you go? Where do you go? John 6. John 6, thank you very much. Okay, you go to John 6, and then you explain the whole thing where Jesus, after multiplying the loaves and fishes, then goes right from there and then begins to teach about how he's going to feed the multitudes, not with loaves and fishes, but with his body and blood. Okay, so he goes on to talk about how God the Father fed the people the manna in the desert. Okay, but that was food that was perishable, and those who ate it died. Then he says, I will give you a bread that will, will consume or sustain you forever, that you may eat and never die. And this bread that I will give, and without even reading the text, uh, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will live forever having life to the full, will abide in me and I will abide in him. Now that's something that's interesting. I gotta remember this, abide? What does that mean to be a person who abides? What does that mean? Do we know? Anyone? You uh, young college students, what does this word mean? Nobody? Can we relate it to marriage? Huh? Can we relate it to marriage? Sure we can. Man and woman abiding in each other? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this implies an intimacy, right? Don't you think? Kind of? Maybe? Sort of? Okay. Okay, so our Lord said that. I will abide in him and he will abide in me. The person who eats my flesh and drinks my blood. Okay, we're going to go back to that. So I simply say, look, you can't get any more clear than what our Lord here said. But when you look at what our Lord said about eating, and I don't know what the word is uh, in Jesus spoke what Aramaic, so I don't know the word he used, but the word that he used for eat means quite literally to crunch or to munch, to tear, right? And the word for drink really translates to guzzle. So he means quite literally, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And as Professor Scott Hahn always points out, look, Obviously, this was not to be meant in a figurative way, as many teach. Okay, oh, it's just a figure of speech. It's not to be taken quite literally. Yeah, it is. Why? Because who can tell me why? You know why. Yes, Dan Fogg, because? Because the, the people murmured before he, he clarified when he really drove the point home. They said, oh, this is a hard teaching. Who can keep it? Can and keep so it? instead of saying, oh, it was, it was, just, a, it was just a metaphor, it was mm -hmm. just an allegory, that, no, he says, really, this is my flesh and this is my blood. That right, I'm so the people grumble, and Scott Hahn points out, Professor Hahn points out, that Jesus would have been, if he was speaking figuratively, would have been morally obligated to say, wait a minute, let me explain, right? But he didn't do that. He simply just told them the truth. And then what did they do? They abandoned him. So obviously the people took him to be quite literal, and he didn't try to correct them. He didn't try to say, wait a minute, um, you know, hold on, let me explain. And he watched them walk away until he turned then to the 12, right, and said, what are you going to do about it? Well, you're going to leave me too? And it was, I think, Peter, right, who spoke up and said, well, you don't know where we're going to go. You're the only one that has the words of eternal life. And if you say we have to eat your flesh and drink your blood, then show us a way to do it. Okay, and it's very simple. Then on the night he was handed over, what did he do? He took bread. And this, by the way, is when the sacrifice 
The sacrifice, not of an animal, but the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to the Father, the perfect man, the priest offering himself as the sacrifice, commenced. Some people say his, his passion commenced the money he entered or, or, or walked out into the, to the, the dirt of the garden. That's not true. The sacrifice commenced, if you read the scripture, from the time, the beginning of the um, Last Supper, right up to the crucifixion, it's one big motion. It's all one big sacrifice. So Jesus, going to the, the last Passover meal, the Last Supper, took bread and said what? Take this and eat it. And what? This is not, he didn't say this is a symbol of my body. He said, this is my body. Took the cup, said the blessing, said as he gave it to them, this is not a symbol, here's a symbol of my blood. No, this is my blood, which is given for you. And as often as you gather in my name, you do this in remembrance of me. As often as you gather in my name, like every Sunday or every day, do this in remembrance of me. Okay, and it's an act of thanksgiving whereby we come together to give thanks to him for this great sacrifice. So now when we get close to death, guess what? You know, death just sort of passes over. We may die physically, but we are taking the glory of our Lord in heaven. Please God. Okay? So, there's that. Then we have St. Paul. And I should mention, by the way, that there was this guy named Ignatius. Uh, uh, how do you spell Ignatius? Is it T-I-U-S? Of Antioch. Right? Is that how you, how do you spell it? C H. Okay, thank you. No spell check on this thing. I look for. <laughs> okay, who can tell anyone know anything about Ignatius of Antioch? He was taught by the Apostle John. Okay, he he was a student of the Apostle John, the same John who stood by Jesus at the cross, the same John who sat next to Jesus at the Last Supper. He had students later on. Ignatius was one of them, uh, and uh, Poly, another guy named Polycarp was another student. Ignatius learned from John, who learned from Jesus. Ignatius, if you plow through his readings, speaks much about the Eucharist, saying, consider it a valid Eucharist, one that is uh, celebrated by the bishop, or one appointed by him. Right? So we have the early church fathers. But if that's not satisfactory, if you go to 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 23 through 26, St. Paul, without looking at it, if you want, you can, but I'm just pointing these out, and you can use these. Okay, in your refutation of, uh, you know, Protestant thought, 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, Paul says, I hand on to you what I myself received from the Lord, that on the night he was handed over, he took bread, said the blessing, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, this is my body, and likewise the cup, saying, Take and eat, this is my blood. Okay, so we have St. Paul saying that. And then we have St. Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, asking the question, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Is not the blood that we drink a sharing in the, or is not the cup that we drink a sharing in the very blood of Jesus Christ? Okay, so how much, how clear can, this is what St. Paul believed. So how, how can, how, it's so clear. It's so clear. Okay, so, if you go, by the way, uh, do we know who Benny Hinn is? No. Uh, you know who he is? He's, um, real, the, uh, I'm not sure what, like Protestant speaker. Or... Yeah, he's a televangelist. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he's got the nice suit, he's got the fancy hair, right? He used to be on with Jan and Paul Krauss a lot on TVN. Okay, and he lives in this mansion and uh, limousine, but he's very popular, and very famous televangelist. Oh, he's a healer, you know, he goes around and hits the people in the head. And they drop. Okay, so he did a talk recently, very recently, and he's speaking to a group of Pentecostal Christians. Okay, I think I can raise this. So he's speaking to a group of Pentecostal Christians. Okay, and he starts out by saying, There are more people healed in the Catholic Church than in our own Protestant churches. And you hear you hear the congregation, these are Pentecostal, and they gasp, you can hear them go. <gasps> That he said that. And he's like, no, no, I mean it. It's true. There are more people in the Catholic Church, more people healed from sickness in the Catholic Church than in our own non-denominational Christian churches. 
And he says, I think I know why. He also mentioned the Orthodox. He said, the Orthodox Jew. He says, I know why. He says, it's because Catholics revere the Holy Eucharist. He said that. And then he goes on to say, listen, friends, Jesus never said, this is a symbol of my body. He said, this is my body. So who knows where the Holy Spirit has taken him. But he said that. There's more healings in the Catholic Church because Catholics revere the Holy Eucharist. An admission, I think, of his belief, really deep down in here, that he believes that the Eucharist really is the body, blood, soul, and the divinity of Jesus Christ. Okay? So if you use these arguments with your friends, and look, you know, before you engage in these conversations, you really need to pray about it first. That the Lord anoints your words and touches that person who you were addressing. All right? In a special way. All right. So uh, having said that, um, two other things. What time is it? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock? Okay, so I have, a, I have a whole half hour, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, so... Um, all right, so let me... let me. Okay, so... Uh, okay. I'll, I'll try to do this. Without confusing you. Okay, so this is the temple constructed by King Solomon. Okay, right here, and if, if I get this backwards, I'm sorry, over here was what is called the showbread. It was an altar with bread on it, showbread, I believe. Over here was the lampstands, okay? This is in the middle section of the chamber. Right here was a very big altar where they sacrificed animals. Right here was a very big pool filled with water, okay? And they burned incense day and night. Why? Because when they sacrificed the animals, right? Here, this big pool of water, why was it there? So it was there because after they sacrificed the animals, they washed in this pool. Okay? What was back here? The Holy, the Holy of Holies. Okay? So they had the Ark of the Covenant, and kept in the Ark of the Covenant with the two stone tablets, okay, and with the Ten Commandments on them. And the Jewish people believe that this is where God made his earthly dwelling because he communicated himself through his law. So that's where he rested his earthly dwelling place. Okay? So this section was quarantined off by a giant curtain. Correct? Right? So don't let me, I wrote this word down. I'll, I'll Okay, so the people would come in, they would sacrifice the animals, okay, they would wash up, right, whole thing, right? Kind of look like masks, you know, after you do the thing, you wash your hands, you get preparation, right? So back here, the Holy of Holies, no person was able to enter this except for the high priest and only on certain times. Okay? All right? Now, Dan asked me to say something about how this ties into um, our own flesh and sexual sin, okay? So, try to do this the best I can. So, this curtain here, if anyone ever desecrated this, this Holy of Holies in any way, there was a penalty. And what was the penalty for desecration of the Holy of Holies? Death, okay? Death. So yeah, Dan said it was death. You got, you got, it was execution. For desecration of the Holy of Holies. All right? So when Paul says, St. Paul says, um, um, uh, you, are temples of the, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we learned in seminary, Father Downing taught, taught us, that the word, when Paul says, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, the word Paul uses is this. Nows. Like talus only with an end. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, like, North Palace would be Naus. <laughs> Pretty funny, huh? Thanks. <laughs> okay, so Naus. So, Paul really says, the original says, he says, you are, when he says you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, he says you are a Naus of the Holy Spirit. You know what this points to? This. It's not the temple, it's the Holy of Holies. So when Paul says you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, he's saying much more than that. 
You are not just a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the nous. You are the holy of holies. Because God himself has come to make his dwelling in you. Right? In you. Now when you receive the Holy Eucharist, guess who you are receiving? God. Jesus Christ. Who is God. Okay, you receive really him. Oh, and if we get time, you know, I'll share with you a couple things about Eucharistic miracles too. Okay, but the point is, when Father Downey was teaching us, there's John Grimes, Jack Grimes, now a priest with New York, sitting right in front of me I'm here in the classroom. Father Downey with his thick Irish brogue is teaching the class. So he's talking about this and about uh, anyone who, you know, desecrated the, the, the naus, okay, punishable by death. Jack spun around in his chair and said, that's why sexual sins warrant hell. Because it's a desecrate. Sexual sins... Not, not sex, proper is proper place, but sexual sins warrant hell because it's a destruction or desecration of the holy of holies. Okay? So your flesh is such that our Lord and you, I mean, think about it. It says something about you that our Lord would come and make his dwelling within you. And when you, by the way, receive the Eucharist, Truly, you are abiding in him, and he is abiding, abiding in you. So there's an intimacy, an intimacy. And I'll tell you something really cool. So when, uh, going back to Adam and Eve, you, you, can I erase this? Going back to Adam, that was cool with that. Okay, so going back to Adam and Eve, after God created the woman, Adam stepped back and said, what? At last, this one is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Okay, when King David, when, when David was anointed king, the people, the Jewish people who were in his line, same blood, same family, right? They shared the same blood. They all came before the king and they said, Hail, he who is flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. Okay, Jesus Christ, who, by the way, this Sunday is the feast of Christ the king. Okay, now feeds the multitude with his body and blood. So that now we, abiding in him and he in us, we can say the same thing, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. There's such an intimacy there with our Lord now that no other Christians can possibly have. Because why? It's the Eucharist, who is God, who we receive into our bodies. And that's something that's an amazing thing. And so this being the case, we have to protect and take care of and respect this vessel that we have been given, okay, the flesh, and think about the flesh itself. Remember, friends, we are body-soul composite. God created the body, and he didn't destroy it. Not just keeping the soul and then discarding the body, but restoring it, and this is all proof by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who rose again, body and soul. And then taking his own mother into heaven, body and soul, tells us something about the dignity of the flesh, of the body itself, and that our Lord would come in the flesh and then give us his flesh and his blood that we may consume, okay, and live in this intimate relationship with him. And by the way, when we talk about intimacy, when you think of intimacy, what do you think of? Marriage and the marriage act. If you go into old churches, if you've been anyone who's been to St. Peter's Basilica, okay, Frank, and that lady right there next to Frank. What's your name? I'm Lauren. Lauren? Okay. What, what did you notice over the altar at, uh, at uh, St. Peter's Basilica? The altar. The... The what? The... The... Whole, there's like no Holy Spirit, the dove. There's a dove? No, no, over the altar, the main altar. The wood? The wood? Okay, that's fine. Maybe that's good, though. It's made out of wood, sure. So they have these things, uh, and I'm just going to uh, to forgive the artwork, okay? So, I mean, yeah, it's just, you know, but yeah, it yeah. kind of spirals like this, kind of cool looking, right? So they got these four pillars. Oh, on the four sides of the altar with a canopy over the top. Okay, this thing is called the baldachino. Okay, baldachino. When we built John Vianney, I'm getting a baldachino. <laughs> the coolest thing in the world. Okay, so got this baldachino. 
So you got these four posts, and, and the reason this is they 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 got it carved and, and stuff. So here's the altar. They got this Baldacchino thing. Okay, so uh, this points to something, and it's very important. Back in the old days, they couldn't build roofs very well, and they leaked. They leaked. So if you were in bed and the roof leaked, what would happen to you? Okay, so you'd get all soaking wet. So here's your bed, right? So on the bed, because the roof leaked, they got this good idea to put a canopy. And they said, what do they call these beds? They still, they still make them. Right? Canopy beds. Is that what they're called? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so these are these posts. And then this canopy, so when it rained in, this thing would catch the water. And the people could sleep in peace without getting wet. Okay, so these were built over, from my understanding, these were built over the altars because it points to something, the wedding bed, where intimacy takes place. So it ties in, and remember something, our Lord spoke of the Eucharist as being a what? A wedding feast. The marriage feast. All kinds of imagery using intimacy and the wedding feast and the marriage and the intimacy of the man and the woman. Okay? And you go back to the original covenant. We are now in the new and everlasting covenant, which is the Eucharist is the sign of that. The original covenant between Adam and Eve was, in fact, a marriage covenant. So now we are in a marriage covenant with our Lord. And also, we could even say that we are in a marriage covenant with each other in that what makes a brother and sister brother and sister is that they share the same blood, the same flesh, the same DNA from mom and dad. Correct? Here's mom, here's dad. They do their thing. Here's brother and sister. The same DNA. Right? The same DNA. What makes us brothers and sisters one with another and we abide in each other, with each other? is what? We share the same blood, the same flesh, which comes from Jesus Christ, who is our God. Isn't that cool? Alright. So, that's that. So, look, this that we have, this body, was meant for something so good, so beautiful, so wonderful. And it is a nous of the Holy Spirit and the fact that we can take into ourselves now that which is so perfect and pure, which is God himself, Jesus Christ, who gave us his flesh and blood that we may consume, okay, and find our way to the glory of heaven. So our bodies must be taken care of and respected. So to take our bodies, what is given to have intimacy with God, and then to trash it and to use it as a tool for pleasure is um, it's why it's mortal sin. And mortal sin means deadly. All right? So we have to take care because uh, we were created. Uh, our Lord created us with the capacity and the ability and has made it so that we are designed to take into our bodies the living God. Isn't that crazy? That's amazing. Okay. What time is it? 14. 714. Okay, good. we got a few more minutes. Okay, here's one last cool thing. Uh, and I think I might have told this group this one time before. In the Old Testament, okay, when after the fall happened, now you know there's really, um, there's two creation stories in the book of Genesis, correct? Then in the third chapter, and we hear about, what do we hear about in the garden? There's the, the, the trees, the, there's the trees, there's the tree of life, there's the, the forbidden fruit tree, right? The tree with the forbidden fruit and all that. But then in the third chapter, we hear about this tree of life that's there. Okay, and after, and life, what, is, what does it take for life? Not just here, but in the life after. What, what is required? There's something that's required. It begins with a G. Grace. Okay? Grace. If we're to live forever in this life and in the next, we need grace. So in the Garden of Eden, uh, this was after the fall, we are told in, the, I think, the third chapter about a tree of life. So we are told that when Adam and Eve, after the fall, they approached this tree of life, okay, to consume its fruit, God placed in front of that tree, after the fall, he put in front of that tree of life an angel, Scripture tells us, with a revolving fiery sword. 
Okay, and, and, and when Adam and Eve approached the tree to receive the fruit of this tree of life, the angel stucks out his arm and says, no, don't come any closer. This tree is not for you. Its fruit is not for you. Because you are now destined for death. Because you messed it all up. So, okay. So, sorry with this thing, right? So, the early church fathers taught that when Jesus Christ, the minute he died on the cross, as he offered himself as the sacrifice, and look, once... Adam and Eve fell. What did God re, uh, retract? What did he take back? Was his grace. So Adam and Eve fell from grace. Okay, so the tree of life they could not eat because they couldn't have grace. They were destined for death. You know, it takes grace to live. The Eucharist feeds us grace. Okay, so the early church fathers taught that when Jesus died on the cross, the minute he died on the cross, and when you watch Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, Oh, the minute Jesus Christ dies on the cross, there's a flashback to hell, and there's the devil screaming bloody murder because he lost his power at that point. So um, there is, um, uh, in the early church fathers, they're teaching, uh, when, when Jesus died on the cross, that angel was called back, okay, that the old tree of life was uprooted with its fruit, and that a new tree was planted, okay? And what would that new tree be? A new tree was planted. This is a teaching of the early church fathers. A new tree was planted. And now we are able, because we've been restored to life again because of grace, we now eat, eat the fruit of this tree. And the fruit of the tree is what? And the Eucharist is the fruit of the tree of life. Because we are actually consuming the fruit of the tree in the Holy Eucharist. Isn't that cool? So that event, it, it points to, it's a prefigurement, a foreshadowing, if you will, of the crucifixion of our Lord. Already in God's design, already back to the very, very beginning. And that's something at the very beginning, even before God created anything, he already had the plan to feed his children the Holy Eucharist. That's something? Now, by the way, because of the Eucharist, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, I believe it was him who said, he called the fall of Adam and Eve, oh, happy fault. Oh, happy fault, which has won for us so great a redeemer. Remember, Adam and Eve, they knew God. They knew their relationship with God. They were not privy. Uh, priv they were not uh, uh, privy okay, to the uh, inner relationship of the Trinity. So they knew God as God. But this inner relationship of the Trinity, they were not really a part of. So when St. Thomas said, oh, happy fault, which has won for us so great a Redeemer. So if this is Jesus Christ, Jesus is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because of the fall and because of the Eucharist, because of Jesus dying on the cross to save us, we are united to Jesus Christ by grace. Grace we receive in the sacraments. We are sustained by the sac sacrament of the Eucharist. So here's you and I together united to Jesus Christ. And why we have it better now than Adam and Eve had it then is guess what? We are now one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So we abide in the whole Trinity. And the Holy Trinity abides in us. Isn't that something? All right. Okay, questions? No questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> one of the common objections you hear is that, as you said, the crucifixion and the redemption of man was once and for all, so why does the Catholic Church call the Mass a re-presentation? <laughs> well, that's it. I would say, no, uh, well, that would be my answer. We call it, no, I would say, look, it's the representation of all time. Right, but if the sacrifice was once and for all, why does there need to be more sacrifices in the form of the Mass? So. Oh, because, well, I, I, here's how I would answer that. I would say, well, because we are bound by space and time, God isn't. So that one sacrifice of Jesus Christ is once for all. But we, in our, in, in our humanness, have a need to represent every day the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to the Father. And Jesus, look... 
Jesus, and I would say, look, Jesus Christ himself gave us the command, right, in, in, in John's Gospel, or in uh, the Gospel, in, uh, well, the, the four Gospels, right, not just John, but to, as often as we gather in his name, do this. Do what? Celebrate the Eucharist. Right? That's, that, would, that would be my answer. Padre, do you have another answer for that? No? Excellent. Yeah, I would say that. I'd say, look, it, it, Jesus himself gives the command that as often as we gather in his name, we do this. It's because we are here in time. We are here in time. Until his second coming, we need to, to commemorate. We need to partake of this life of the life tree. How do we do that? You know, we can't just serve the liturgy now at OLPH and then have it for 100 years. <laughs> I don't know, too, uh, again, uh, it'd be hard to come up with an idea. Wouldn't you put gas in your car one time and drive it forever? <laughs> How's that work? You know, so. Yeah, so it's the re-presentation. I'm trying to think of something else that's it. But the re it's simply the, re the act of re-presenting. That's an, an important distinction, though, right? That it's a re-presentation and not a... It's a spiritual sacrifice. It's something yeah. not, not, you know, right. okay. yeah. commemoration, remembrance. Mm -hmm. Make it, it present, making Christ present now, mm -hmm. at this time, you know, through priest who is ordained, who is representing the Christ and acting in persona Christi. Mm -hmm. so. Now, by the way, how much time? How, how much time? Give me, give me. Time. It's a twenty something, twenty two. Oh, all right. Think about this. Okay, this is really cool. So, any other? Did that try and help me? <laughs> Okay, so God gives us the bread, he gives, gives us the wheat, right? Gives us the, he gives us the wheat, uh, he gives us the grape. Then we take the, grape, the wheat and we grind it down, we make bread. We take the, 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 the grape and, you know, uh, we crush the grape, make wine, ferment it the whole bit, right? Then we go, we go to, we have mass, we take this bread, this wine, we offer it to the Lord, Okay, we offer it up, we together, offer it up to the Lord. Then he gives us back his son, the Eucharist, in the transformation, the transfiguration. He gives us back his son. Then we take the son and we offer it back to him as the sacrifice in thanksgiving for one thing, but also to atone for our sins and to win God's favor. And, that's, and, that, and then we get in return eternal life. So he gives, we give back, he gives back, we give back, he gives back. Isn't that cool? Right? And we do it in the Holy Spirit. And we do it in the Holy Spirit, absolutely. And when we're at Mass, it's Jesus who offers himself as the sacrifice to the Father. It's the priest who, uh, the priest who offers, so Jesus offers himself, the, the priest offers Jesus to the Father. You, the people, uh, okay, you got it, okay, but you, the people, you got it, right? You offer, uh, together with the priest, you offer Jesus to the Father, but also at the same time, you offer the sacrifice of yourself as the priest offers the sacrifice of himself. So you want to talk about participation. People say, well, we need the people to participate by singing in the responses. Hey, that's all great, but it's much more than that. Here's where the real participation begins. It's Jesus offering himself to the Father, the priest offering Jesus, you offering Jesus together with the priest, but you offering the gift of yourself, your heartaches, your hurts, your tears, but your joys and everything else. You too offering yourself to the Father and also the priest, okay, offering himself to the Father. In the Holy Spirit, together with our Lord. Isn't that something? Okay. Is that, is that enough for one night? Any questions? We got, we got more time if you want it, Father. I'm okay. So how important it is to be present at the liturgy? Can't I stay at home and just pray my prayers? <laughs> and to be spiritually connected to the, to the parish, you know? If you're sick... So why, why, why am I required to be present with, with my body in a church? Uh, let's see. If what I we believe, say? really... If I believe, and I, if you know, if I make an act of perfect contrition, I can, you know, even participate. If, even though I, I can't go to the confession right now. Okay. So, so that's this two. Is, this so is, that's, this that's is two just. Questions. That's two questions. No, no. This is just something. 
So now if I believe and I really want to receive, but I, you know, I just would like to be at home today. Yeah. I don't want to be in the church. So why okay, should so I be in the church? Well, I would say, here's, a, here's the answer I would give. I said, hey, can a man and woman who are married have intimacy with each other if they're sleeping in different rooms? I mean, you know, no. So look, if I'm not present, I have to be, I have to make, Jesus is going to make himself present to me on the altar that I may consume him. I need to make myself present so that I can actually consume him. Okay, otherwise, if it were just a spiritual thing, Jesus would have said, you know, stay home and I'll, I'll just feed you spiritually. <laughs> he didn't, he said, as often as you gather in my name. And he talked about where two or three are gathered in his name, there I am. He gave us, really set it up for us to, we may gather, and this was a practice of the early church coming together, and even in the Old Testament. Look, they all came together on the Feast of Passover, all the families together, men and women, children, everybody gathered together to offer these sacrifices. So I would say, unless you're sick, if you're homebound, and even then you should have someone bring the Eucharist to you, right? This lady once, I went to the hospital, right? She said, uh, I want Holy Communion. I said, okay. When was the last time you went to confession? Oh, I don't believe in that. <laughs> <laughs> I would never confess my sins to a man. I said, so you've made your first confession a long time ago? Yes, it's been a long time, but I don't believe it. Because I don't believe that, uh, you know, I should have to confess my sin. I tried to explain the whole thing. and I don't believe that. Uh, you know, and I think it was, uh, I forget who said it. You know, well, what about, you know, things like baptism, right? You don't just baptize yourself. You can just say, well, I baptize me in the name of the Father and so on, right? <laughs> so why is it, you know, the sin is, is such a part of our lives because it's what we do, unfortunately, so we need this sacrament of confession, which Jesus Christ himself instituted. So this lady was, but she demanded the Eucharist. And I said, well, oh, and, and she said, I just go, I take my sins right to God. I said, okay, that's, you know, fine. You, you want to go right to God, go ahead. But I told her, I said, then you won't need me to bring you communion. I said, in 10 minutes, the lunch lady's going to be coming here. She'll have bread on a plate. You just set the plate aside and you say to Jesus, okay, Jesus, make this your body and blood. And you have the Eucharist. Okay, honey? She got mad. Did she give the Eucharist to her? No, she wouldn't go to confession. And it's been a long time. I said, no, honey, until you make a good confession. And why is this? You have to be in a state of grace. You have to be in a state of grace. You have to be pure. The scripture, the Old Testament, okay, or New Testament. In fact, the last book of the Bible. Nothing impure can enter heaven. Nothing impure can enter heaven. So that means the opposite is true as well, or, or the reverse. Nothing perfect can enter something that is impure. Right? So you have to be in a state of grace. Paul said, uh, I think it's what St. Paul said, um, whoever eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood unworthily, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. There's two ways to take that. One is if a person receives the Eucharist without believing. Oh, I don't really believe it. They eat and drink judgment upon themselves. I also think it also means that if a person is in a state of grave moral sin, they, they do damage to themselves by receiving the Holy Eucharist. But you can't put... You can't put, look, in the Ark of the Covenant, when they constructed it, uh, it was out of God who gave the instructions to Moses. It had to be constructed a certain way. Acacia wood, which is a wood that doesn't deteriorate, had to be used. The metal had to be uh, melted down for a certain amount of time and pounded out a certain way. Everything inside had to be absolutely perfect and pure before those two stone tablets could be placed inside where God would make his dwelling. Okay. The Blessed Virgin Mary, okay, before uh, holding the child Jesus, had to be purified of every stain of sin so that the child would be held in her and be perfected, not just in his divinity, but in his humanity. All right? So we have to be, to the best of our ability, uh, purified of mortal sin in order to receive the Holy Eucharist. All right? uh, now, what about venial sins? Well, when you consume the Eucharist, your venial sins are washed clean. The mortal sin, you have to go to. All right? Because why? Here's why. 
Venial sin, while it damages the soul, mortal sin kills the soul because it separates. So if this is you, and this is Jesus Christ, okay? Look at this chasm. This is you in a state of mortal sin. You can't receive the Holy Eucharist. You can't receive Jesus until you get back into a state of grace and are united to him once again. Grace, I always think of it as the glue that bonds you onto the person of Jesus Christ. Mortal sin does what? Breaks the bond. Okay. So, here you can receive Jesus, here you're separated. All right. Anything else? No other questions? No? <laughs> yes, sir? So, <clears throat> When in John chapter 6, when Jesus is talking to the crowds, mm -hmm. the words he uses to describe, the words he uses when he says, I am the, I am the living bread, he, he who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood has, has no life within him. The words he uses are very graphic, mm -hmm. correct? To kind of drive that point down that he's speaking literally. Mm -hmm. So in light of that, how come, and this, this is just a curiosity, how come... Pre-Vatican II, the lay people were, it was, it was customary or taught to them not to bite down on the host when they received Holy Communion. Because I was told that's how it used to be, and now when Catholics receive Holy Communion, they're, they're crunching Jesus like he's a cracker. Yeah, but I think in the early church, they, they would actually eat, right? So how did that, I, you know, I don't know the history on that, how that happened, where it eventually became like, you know, not to, to, to munch down on, to crunch. I don't know. Do you have any idea? Because I know in the like say in the early church, you know, the, by the way people carried the Eucharist on them in the early church in case they were martyred which very big possibility so before they were mar martyred they could, they could consume the Eucharist. So where that came to be a thing where they you, you didn't crunch down on it and there was a time, I hear this from the old New Yorkers man, if we crunch down the nuns would whack us, boy, right? Bam. Right up. By the way, uh, confessions at St. Thomas Aquinas, where all the New Yorkers live, because I live there, you know? The confessions with the old New Yorkers, the, uh, the guys, right? It, they're the best. The old guys. They come in, they come in, they go, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been three months, my last confession. Two times this, eight times that, and four times that. That's it, Father. In <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds, and they're done. Boom, my next guy. It's awesome. Okay, I got sidetracked. Okay, so um, what was the question? <laughs> Again, real quick. So how come, as you as you just said, it, the, the, in New York, if if you if, you, if the nuns saw you biting down on the okay, horse, yeah, where see, did that? I'm, I'm not sure. There's a history to that, and uh, also the thing with you know there for, for like for before Vatican II, like from the between the time of Trent, you know, priests had to have their hands a certain way like this. And where that, and, uh, and also where there was a lot of disciplines. I think it, it probably we could say it was a discipline because the church can give disciplines to priests and to the laity. So for the longest time, up until Vatican II, we, you could not receive the Eucharist. Uh, the last time you, from, the time, from midnight until the, the day you received the Eucharist, you could not have anything, not even water. Not even water. Okay, from midnight until the time you received. So let's say you went to the 5 o'clock evening Mass at St. John Vianney. You could not, from midnight until 5 p.m., until after you received the Eucharist, you could not take anything, not even water. You know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, that was that. Isn't that something? Until after you received the Eucharist. So that was a discipline, and that changed. I'm glad it did. Okay, so... Perhaps that was something, you know, sometimes these things develop because it's just what we say, pious, um, pious uh, practice. And, 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 and things like the, the, when people hold hands during the Our Father, that's just something people started doing. So it could be, and I don't know, that people just started doing that out of respect for the Eucharist, right? Could be, I, I don't know. Do you, do you happen to know? Yeah, so I don't know. Yes, sir. Isn't there uh, still an hour that you have to abstain from eating? Yeah, so it's an hour before receiving the Eucharist, not an hour before Mass. But it's a good idea to do an hour before Mass just to be on the safe side. But uh, So I, I know guys that, uh, okay, Father Mansfield always gives like 15-minute sermon. 
So they're sitting there timing it out. Let's see, okay, so right? So if he, if he mass starts at 10, and let's see if he, okay, so 10, 15 minute sermon, so we should be having communion at, uh, let's see, a quarter till. <laughs> Sorry, I got two minutes. Uh-huh. Were you going to talk about Eucharistic miracles? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. We, we got a few seconds? Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you for bringing that up. So, um, G okay, so I, has anybody ever studied these Eucharistic miracles? If you ever get a chance to go to the Eucharistic Minute Miracle, Eucharistic, the miracles of the Eucharist display which travels through the diocese, go see it. It's fascinating. So, you know, we have, okay, first of all, we have the blood that they took off the, uh, the Shroud of Turin, right? Samples of, of blood, dried blood on the Shroud of Turin. Okay, they determine it's a certain, I forget the blood type, but it's a certain blood, right? So, um, in, uh, let's see, in, uh, Let's see, where Lanciano, Italy, okay, and uh, some 700 years ago, I think, the priest was celebrating the Eucharist. He was having doubts about the Eucharist, not believing it. And trust me, when you're celebrating the Eucharist, the devil does his best to try to convince you that that's not really a real thing, right? So, the priest is celebrating, and as he was, in this case, uh, lifting the host, okay, not only did the substance change, but also the accidents change. Okay, he found himself holding, with blood dripping down his arm, uh, holding a piece of what appeared to be human flesh. All right? So it's in a case now, you can go to Lanciano, Italy, you can see it. All right? So the blood on this just happens to match the blood that's found on the Shroud Tur. Okay? So, um, oh, and by the way, now they know, because they've done tests on it, that the tissue is actually heart tissue from the left ventricle of the heart, the human heart, okay? So, uh, let's see. So that was Lanciano then. Uh, then in, um, uh, let's, well, there's another one that was uh, in Argentina when a guy named Francis, Pope Francis was the bishop there, the Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio in one of his parishes. A priest had celebrated Mass, and after Mass, this lady came up and said, Father, I think there's a host that somebody left. They must have walked out with it, but they left it on the candlestick in the back. So he went and he picked it up and he said, yeah, it's a, it's a Eucharistic host. But he didn't know if it was consecrated or not. So the, the rule is you take the host and you soak it. If you don't know where it's been, you soak it in water. And after a few hours, it dissolves into just, you know, just dissolves. And you take, what you, you just take the contents, you pour it down in this thing called a scorium which is a sink that has a pipe that just goes right into the dirt, not into the sewer, that would be inappropriate. So it's, it just goes into a hole in the ground. So he, he put the host in the what we call a little ablution jar to, 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 uh, to uh, dissolve it. So he comes back a few hours later, and it wasn't dissolved. So he comes back the next day, it wasn't dissolved. Comes back the next day, not dissolved. Comes back again, and, and there's like a red, blotchy substance on it. Right? And it appears to be oozing something red. So he calls in Cardinal Bergoglio, who is now Pope Francis, to check it out. Takes it. Uh, he he takes a sample of it. Takes a, to recall, He has a friend who's a scientist who comes in and says, uh, looks at it and, and determines, does a test, says, well, this is human blood. So Bergoglio himself, long story short, took um, a sample. Had one part of the sample sent to uh, a lab in San Francisco, California. Then sent the other a particle to, um, or the other sample to um, New York University, and didn't tell these guys what they were looking at. He said, "Just tell. I just need a report what these these are." So the the the, 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 the after the test, the the, the 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 test results from San Francisco came back, and they told him, "Okay, this is it's human flesh and it's human blood," and they gave him the blood type. Just matches the blood on the miracle in Lanciano, which matches the blood also on the Shroud of Turin. Okay, so then they get back the test results from the New York University, and the guy says, "Okay, it's it's heart tissue, and it's the left ventricle of the heart." Now, the left ventricle is the part of the heart that pumps blood to the rest of the body. Did you know this? Right, pumps blood to the rest of the body. Isn't that crazy? So, um, and here's the amazing thing. 
Well, if that's not amazing enough. <laughs> and by Dean, shouldn't it be? <laughs> okay, but so this the guy, the lab the lab in San Francisco or New York says, okay, well here's what's puzzling. There are uh, bl white blood cells cannot. I guess they can't live outside the body for too terribly long before they die. They're like so, right? The 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 the, 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 the scientist said there's the presence of white blood cells, white cells. Okay, which tells us that this is, it's alive. It's alive. It's, this thing is still animated, right? So, and you can read all about it. Just go to the web and, and you can check it out. So, um, this is all stuff given to who is now our Pope. So, left ventricle of the heart, same blood type found on the other Eucharistic miracle in Monciano, same blood type found on the Shroud of Turin, white blood cells, left ventricle of the heart, so, as Father De Palma likes to say, look, when we're receiving the Eucharist, we're receiving the living, beating heart of Jesus Christ. Right? So, another miracle, recently in Poland, Eucharistic miracle, same thing, left ventricle of the heart, same blood type found on the Shroud of Turin, same blood type found on the, the miracle of Lanciano, same blood type found on the Eucharistic miracle in Buenos Aires uh, uh, in Argentina. So um, there's, a, there's a book, too, that is, is out called Eucharistic or Miracles of the Eucharist, and you should get it, and it's fascinating. And, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. And then even at John Vianney, the church on past, pastorate, we had a cool thing happen, uh, the face appearing on, on something. So I'll let Josh show that to you as long as I'm done. Okay, what time is it? 42. 42 what? 7.42. Because I've gone over, didn't I? Hmm. What time did I start? 6.30, maybe a little bit past. Okay. All okay. right, so are we good? We're cool? Any other questions? Any questions? No? Yes, sir. So, there was, I don't know where exactly it is in the gospel, but it's where, it's where Christ is talking about the living bread, and that he is the living bread. Mm -hmm. And that, well, it's probably in John. John chapter 6. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he says, your forefathers who ate the manna from heaven, they ate this bread and they died. Mm -hmm. But when you consume the living bread that I will offer you, you shall not die. What is Jesus referring to when he says death? Okay, whenever Jesus talks about it, you remember the story when Jesus went to uh, the home of the little girl and they did you or you know they the Lord was delayed or no it was Lazarus right? I think well maybe even the, the little girl who died. Uh, it's too late she's dead and Je well I can't remember is either Lazarus or the, the twelve year old girl the daughter of Jairus the daughter of Jairus what did Jesus say Oh she's not dead she's merely sleeping. So Jesus, for Jesus, death is merely sleep, right? When Jesus speaks about death, he always points to something else. The second death, which is the death of the soul, hell. When our Lord speaks of death, he speaks of damnation, condemnation of the soul. So um, when Jesus uh, says that, that you will never die, in other words, you consume me, you will never see the destruction of your soul. You will never see the second death. You will be spared the hell, right? It's your salvation. Mm -hmm. Now, when Christ was saying, your forefathers ate the manna from heaven, they ate this bread and they died, he wasn't referring to everyone, right? Obviously not everyone. Uh, when, they, when you say what? That they... Well, because you said that when Jesus is talking about death, you're referring to, he's right. referring to the destruction okay, of the soul. Okay, the reason that, look, so when, when but, okay, so they, they died, not only did they die physically, but they also died, look, before Jesus died on the cross, guess what? You know this? Grace? Grace is necessary for salvation. You cannot live in God, you cannot live united to God in this life or in the next without grace. So know this, there's no, no life. Okay? There's no life. So, the ancestors ate, so everybody after Adam and Eve, everybody, because no one had, great. God took back his grace. So every single person conceived and born after Adam and Eve, when they died, they went to, well, the Jews call it the place of the dead. Okay, eternal separation from God. Okay, until the moment Jesus died on the cross. So these people who ate the manna in the desert, they did die. They died the first death and they died the second death. So for, they were just separated from God. Okay, so when Jesus Christ died on the cross, grace was restored to humanity. And what do we pray when we pray the credo? He descended into hell. 
Why? Why did he descend into hell? He went into hell for a purpose, to gather all those souls who had faith in the coming Messiah, to get them out of that place of death and to rise them up again. There's a really cool icon that I saw once, and I wish I had purchased this. Purchase, purchased, purchased it, but I never did. I wish I would. In any case, it shows great. So it shows. I've seen others like it, but it just didn't compare. So it's Jesus Christ standing with his arms up like this after the resurrection. Actually, he's coming out of the tomb, and there's two coffins right here, right? And they're but the chains are busted. The, the chains that busted, the, the lids are popping off, and out of this one comes a man, and out of this one comes uh, Eve, right? Adam and Eve coming up out of the tombs, okay? Because they did experience the second death. Okay, so when Jesus died on the cross, okay, so now even though we experienced the first death, we won't experience the second. Okay, we will get to go to the glory of heaven. And I'm going to have jet black hair like I used to. Michael? <laughs> <laughs> All right.